Check them out, and if you have any questions, you know, if you came to potluck and board meeting, that would be a good place for us to discuss that. So don't forget that that's this afternoon. Well, then you're then you're in trouble, okay? And Tom, I'm going to point you out. Don't worry. Thank you for what you did today, because see, on Tom on his sheet said he said I would love to help, but my work schedule just doesn't allow it. So I know you love to help. I didn't ask you. That was all Debbie. So that's how God does these things. And thank you for your willingness to do it. I did not have any clue till she said you were going to do it. So praise God. A uh, couple other things too, just before we get into some things. Henry will be here next week again too. Because he's going to give the message. So if you get a chance to talk to him today and welcome him and his family, do that. Keep Brent especially in your prayers. If you're not familiar with what's going on there, he has Lyme disease and he is stepping down from the United Methodist Church here and he will be moving to South Carolina? One of the Carolinas. I believe South Carolina. His last Sunday will be, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday and there will be a meet and greet after that if you want to go or anything. Keep in uh, prayers his health and everything and especially the church. Anytime there's change, Satan's going to do all he can to get in the midst and stir things up again so that he can have glory rather than God have glory. So just keep those different things in mind. Don't forget your thank offering. That's totally separate. So you know that was that sheet with each day. Give this and that if you read the sheet. And if you didn't, you still have time to give. And don't forget the water bottles. You're invited to take them and participate in that and give the money to Jacob. And Jacob did not know what was going on this morning. We just talked about that. We talked about his part of the ministerial association. And he said, I just want to feel a part of. And I'm like, that's a great thing, but where do you think God is doing in your life? Oh, yeah, he's calling me. I recognize it and everything. I said, well, then we'll figure out something to do. So I hope that that meant a lot to everybody. It sure means a lot to me, especially my gratitude and thanks to God for his faithfulness. Because years ago, he left to go to the foreign land, and then he came back. And I just can only thank God for that. And I want to share a couple scriptures before we start on the message. This is from 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 12. If you know, Barnabas took Paul under his wings and actually started him and helped him in ministry. And then Paul saw the calling of Timothy, a young man, and he helped bring him into ministry. And he even called him his son, if you look in scriptures. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 through 12, and she doesn't have these. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teachings, and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. I think we can all learn from that. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good. But training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone <coughs> learn them. 
Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in, in your love, your faith, and your purity. And then in Paul's second letter to Timothy, in chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, he writes, So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord, and don't be ashamed of me either. Even though I'm in prison for Him, with the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was His plan from the beginning of time, to show us His grace through Jesus Christ. Don't forget that's what it's about. We're going to look today at what the second candle means. It could be peace, we talked about, and we're looking at it as in prophecy. The prophecy that was fulfilled, the last scripture that Ruby read was from Romans 5.1. That prophecy has been fulfilled that, so that we could have peace. Either way, we light these candles. That's what God is telling us. That's His message, that He loves us. And the only way that we're going to get peace is to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to know Him personally, to know His attributes because that is God's attributes, to know His humbleness, His humility, His compassion, His love, so that we can, by our good deeds, let our light shine. Because see, we always want to say, let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. But it's that we may, they may see our good deeds. If we're out there just waving our spotlights and we don't have the love to show in action, not just word, then we're just shining the spotlights on ourselves, not on God. Because why would Christians love indeed in actions except that they're different? They're empowered by the Spirit. They're a new creation in Christ. So don't forget the deed parts. And that's what the pastors recognize in Jacob. He does more than we do. <laughs> You've seen that. And I'm so thankful that God has put a calling on his life. So let me ask you a question. What do you want for Christmas? Think about it. How about peace? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Did you see Linus on the little thing? Watch Charlie Brown Christmas if you get a chance because <laughs> the gospel message is read in it. Still today, it's not been censored yet as far as I know. They had the Charlie Brown Christmas the other day and I didn't get to watch it. But as far as I know, he still read Luke chapter 2. If you don't know it, the president this week said that a Savior was born 2,000 years ago. Wow! We need to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to love others. And we need to show that love in action. So Romans 5.1 Paul wrote, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know there's the word therefore, so you know we're going to go backwards in a minute, but we'll get to that because we have to. We have to know what he's talking about to know what he's saying here. But let's define peace first. What is peace? Merriam-Webster's dictionary says this, A state of tranquility or quiet, freedom from civil distur disturbance, a state of security. The second definition is freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. Puts a little more inward instead of outward. Harmony and personal relations. Fourth one, a state or period of mutual concordance. There's no war or threat of war between governments. Does that sound like a good idea of peace? Sounds like a good worldly definition of peace. It sounds like something we want, but see, that definition of peace is contingent upon other factors. How could Paul write about peace when he is imprisoned, when his life is being threatened, when at any moment in time he doesn't know what's going to happen to him? How could he be at peace? Because he doesn't experience these things, but yet he writes about peace. So let me give you an example. I'm sitting in my favorite easy chair, right? My headphones are on to take away the distractions. I'm listening to soothing music. No words, because I don't want to hear the words distracting. Just comforting music. All is well, right? I've cleared my thoughts of everything that's going on. I have a pair of 3D goggles on. 
and I'm watching cute little puppies dancing in a field of daisies. <laughs> right? Now, that's not all. My beautiful, loving wife is beside of me holding my hand, and she's doing the same thing. So we're at peace with each other. Right? We've even took a couple Tylenol extra strength just to cut the nerve off just in case. <laughs> so we can really relax, right? <clears throat> and I forgot this. Everyone in our family is healthy, happy, wise. Life is good. They're all getting along. Our 401ks are budgeting or, or bulging. Cure for cancer has been found. There's no threat of war whatsoever. Kim Jong-un is not even firing any missiles. <laughs> there is peace on earth, goodwill to men, right? But then all of a sudden, all those definitions in the dictionary were taken care of, right? We hit all those definitions. The power goes off because that interrupts my music. Distractions I can start hearing and coming into my, to my thoughts that I was all just puppies before. The soothing music is gone. My children come running in the room, their, to their clothes torn and ash on them because bombs are being dropped out of the sky. I don't know about the rest of my family or anything else. Could I have peace? See, that's why God sent His only Son that you could experience peace in a world full of chaos. He came at the most desperate time in the history of mankind to a nation that had basically forgot about Him. But He came so that we could have peace. Not the dictionary definition of peace, but that we could have peace. Because we know in that second situation that I described, that all is well. Because my wife is there with me. My children are still there and we have been justified freely by faith. So that no matter what happens, I will spend eternity with God my Father in heaven. Not God my Creator, but God my Father. The one who loves me. I know how I love my son as an imperfect man. And I know my heavenly father loves me so much more. That's the kind of peace that God intends for you. That's why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. Humbly to this world. And he came to die for you and I. John 14, 27 reads this way. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Those are the letters in red. Those are Jesus' words to us. The New Living Translation gives a little different, so I want to read that one also. I am leaving you with a gift. Wouldn't that be a precious gift for everyone to have this Christmas? You should at least experience it and show the others through your deeds. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. You're searching in the wrong place if you're trying to find it there. So since you have this peace, do not be troubled or do not be afraid. The word peace here means complete or sound if you go study its definition. Complete, total peace. Because you know that God loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but instead have the exact opposite of what we deserve, everlasting eternal life with God our Father in heaven. That's why the angels came and proclaimed peace on earth. The Old Testament foretold of this peace. It would be come, coming through the Messiah. But yet the Jews rejected Him because they didn't see the Messiah coming the way they wanted to see it. Didn't change the fact of anything. Jesus went out building relationships. He cured the sick. He healed the blind, the mute, the lame. And yet still people couldn't see it. He even entered into Jerusalem that, week, that last week as a king. But on Friday He was being crucified because that was God's plan. His Son had to come to this earth to die so that He might save you and I. 
Paul is such a good example of a life changed. You know, his name used to be Saul, right? Then he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it forever changed his life. He found peace, true peace, and his life was never the same. And he could not keep quiet about it as a result. He had to tell others, because he only had a limited amount of time in this physical body to tell others about the love of God through Jesus Christ. Peace is something that everyone wants, longs for, but only a few find. It's what the angels proclaimed about that night. Paul knew that peace, and he teaches us about that peace. He said it in Romans 5. So in order to, in order to, in order to understand that, we need to go back and look at Romans, because we had that word therefore, right? In chapter 1 of Romans, Paul, this new creation in Christ, he pours out his passion to the people at Rome of why he wrote this letter, why he was persuaded, why he tried so hard, how he found peace in the midst of all the turmoil. He had a burning passion and drive to tell others of the love of God because he had experienced that love and that peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. Prophecy had been fulfilled and peace was here on earth to men whom God found favor in. In Romans 1, verses 1 through 7, Paul starts his letter this way. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This prophecy is about his son, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through who the Spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. No doubt who scriptures foretold about. The resurrection proved it. Paul says, here is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I've been set apart. I am a servant or slave for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship. All of us were set aside as those apostles with a mission to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for His namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong, bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Belong to Jesus Christ. Your, your lives are not your own. Verse 7, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be His holy people. As we learn in Peter, priests, each and every one of us are called to be priests. Then we see grace and peace, which is what Paul mostly puts in his letters, because that's the gospel message. Because God loved us so much, and there was nothing that we could do about it. He was merciful and kind, and He presented a way to save us. But not only that, we get to become children of God. We get to be a part of the gospel plan. We could have simply been, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, we could have simply accept Jesus and He'd take us on to heaven. But we get to live life here bringing Him glory and honor so that others may see our good deeds and glorify our Father who art in heaven. Wow! So are we using our lives to bring Him honor and glory? Grace and peace comes through Jesus Christ. Grace that we can be His children and know that peace that surpasses all understanding so that we can comfort others, we can love others, we can do for others so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which art in heaven. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful privilege that we have as children of the Most High. We can experience true peace that the world cannot comprehend, that the world searches for in every other lie that Satan puts out there in front. If you just have the wealth, you'll have the peace. If you have power, you'll have the peace. If you just have a loving family and everybody's getting along, you'll have peace. But then circumstances change and your peace is thrown out the window, right? Not if you realize what you've gained through Jesus Christ. 
Not if you know you're a daughter and son of the Most High God who will never forsake you, who loves you so passionately. Paul goes on to say in chapter 1 of Romans in verse 14, because of this grace and peace that God has given me, I am obligated, I have an obligation both to the Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish, and that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. That's why the next candle is going to be proclamation. Because we've got to tell the story. We're coming up to Christmas. When our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born, we have to tell the story to others so that they may know the grace that has been given to them and find the peace that God wants them to experience. First to the Jew, then the Gentile. Verse 17, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, here's more prophecy, the righteous will live by faith. So are you? You've been set and made righteous, have a right standing with God, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And Lord, don't forget that. But are you living by faith as you're right, already declared righteous before God? Paul continues on in the letter talking about the wickedness of men and that God must judge sin. But He loves. He has mercy and compassion. And even though all have sinned, He wants them to come to salvation. He wants them to experience that peace that Jesus will give them. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, we read, The righteousness, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely. It's a free gift by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. When He was obedient and left heaven, to become a man, to live an example, to teach us, and then to die for us. God Himself humbled Himself. So why is our life so important that we won't humble our lives before Him? Verse 25 says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement to cover our sins and bring us back to a right relationship with God. And this was through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He or God did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. In chapter 4, he goes on to talk about justification, and he specifically uses Father Abraham so that there is no confusion here. Father Abraham was not made righteous because he was a Jew, an Israelite, because of his heritage. He wasn't made righteous because of the things he did. He was righteous because of his faith. Jesus Christ had not been born yet, but had been prophesied that he would come. And he believed that prophecy would be fulfilled. We've seen it. We know it to be a fact. So we need to proclaim it. <clears throat> then we get to Romans 5, chapter 1. Therefore, so you see a little difference here? Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I do want to go backwards into chapter 4 before we dig into 5 yet though. So let's go back to Romans 4, 16. It says, therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Okay, have you seen a pattern? How'd that verse start? Oh, we got to go backwards again. Okay, let's go back to 13. We didn't go back far enough. Hope this gets you interested at least. So you can see, ha, ah, let me read more about this story. 
So let's go back to verse 13. Verse 13 says, It was not through the law that Abraham and his offering, offspring received the promise, hmm. that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Getting a pattern here? For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath. It just points out that we are sinful and need a Savior. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. So you don't have to be an Israelite. You have to have the faith of Father Abraham. He is the father of us all. Verse 17, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into beings things that were not. This is the God that controls life in his hand. Against all hope. So don't get discouraged. Think back. Abraham had hope. Abraham in his hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Remember the story? God made him a promise and that was our first candle, right? I believe it was, the promise. And then we see it told about in prophecy. God had made him a promise to be the father of many nations but he's getting old. His wife's getting old and his prayers aren't answered. Then finally his prayers get answered and he's given a son and he does some other things that he shouldn't have done trying to take things into his own hands. And we've done that before. And then God says, sacrifice your only son. Wow. And we think our faith is tested. We are so blessed in this country, free from persecution. Like I said, our persecution is somebody at work might say, you're a Christian. We're free to tell others of Jesus Christ. We've got the greatest opportunity in history. On our phones, you can simply go to the Word of God. If you don't understand something, you can look at another translation, a commentary, whatever, so that you're fully equipped to tell them about Jesus Christ. And you don't even need that in the first place. There's some of you that are recognizing that. All you need to do is be willing, because guess what? He gives you the gifts and the abilities in the first place. Look back at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament, look at all the stories of people who were unqualified. And God used them in a mighty way to bring Him glory and honor. Because the story is about Him, not about us. <clears throat> Verse 19, Without weakening in His face, He faced the fact that His body was as good as dead since He was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was already dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was, strengthening, was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. See the pattern there? Glory to God in the highest, right? Verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised to do. See that? This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in Him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Now remember, Scripture keeps on reading. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we, or let us, have peace with God that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace we're talking about, that we're children of the Most High. We didn't get what we deserved, but instead He lavishly poured out riches upon us. If we got what we deserved, we would have got eternal separation. If He was merciful, He might have let us escape that eternal separation. And I'm not even going to the things we'll face, would face there. But he then says, now I'm going to bring you in as my child and pour out all of these things that you could never fathom because you believed in me, because I'm God 
and I want to lavishly pour this out on you. Then the verse 2 says on, goes on to say, And we let us boast or proclaim that next candle in hope of the glory of God. We have peace because God continues to give His promises and He will forever give His promises. The gift of prophecy so that we can proclaim the pink candle, the joy that we have in Christ. See the pattern there? This morning, Merle read Luke 2, 11 through 14. And it read this way in the NIV. And it may be the way you learned it. It may not be the way you've learned it. It said, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom His favor rests. Is that the way you remember the verse? That's not the way Linus read it. Linus read it this way. King James Version. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Does that read any differently to you? Let's look at the NLT before we look at this further. The NLT says, The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize Him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now you may be a fan of King James, you may be a fan of NIV, NLT, you may say that, oh, they just all confuse me. Well, if they do, then I've got international children's Bibles out there. We can go back to the first grade reading level, and that's okay, because it's the Word of God... And He will enlighten His Word to you. That's why you can read it over and over again and say, I didn't read that before. I didn't study that before. It was right there in black and white, but today it jumped off the page at me. Now when it did, what am I going to do with that since it jumped off the page? Because it's living, dividing even the soul so that I have to make a decision about what I read. But how do I know which one of these is correct? Well, the NLT, let's look at it first, said the Savior... So we got the same words that we have in NIV and King James. We have Messiah, which was in the NIV, but was not in the King James. Nothing wrong with that, because the Messiah is what Jesus was called in the Old Testament. So they're just putting it in the NIV and NLT for you so you understand that. They added that portion in there so you'd know that in the Old Testament, what was foretold about was called the Messiah. In the New Testament, we know Jesus as the Christ. Okay? No problems there. The NLT says Bethlehem. We didn't see that in either one before. But we know from reading Scripture that is the city of David, right? So again, nothing wrong with that. And you will recognize Him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. Well, we had wrapped in cloth in NIV. We have wrapped in swaddling cloth in the King James. The NLT just explains that that's strips of cloth, right? Now you know why I say when I like the NLT. Why? Because it explains a little more. It's a little more reader friendly. But there are people that say, oh, you can't read the NLT because it adds this or that. Okay? But that's a different topic. Then it said, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host. NIV said great company and heavenly host. King James said multitude of heavenly host. Then the NLT goes on to say the armies of heaven. Well, you think about it. If you're a shepherd out there that night and an angelic being comes to you in the first place and then he is joined by a vast host of angelic beings, I'm going to think it's an army, an invasion, whatever, right? I'm going to be terrified. That's why he says, do not be afraid. So I have no problem with the, the, the NLT putting that in there. And he said, they're praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heavens. Because see, that's what Scripture's all about again, giving glory to God, right? And peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. So now that last part, 
We have the NIV saying those on whom His favor rests. The NLT say those with whom God is pleased. That's totally different than what the King James says. The King James says, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Doesn't that include all men? The other two versions said it's only those people that God finds favor in, He's pleased with. Which one's right? Well, you can dig into it if you want to. And the King James, when they were doing, missed something in the Greek. So that's why most people go now with the newer interpretations go the way that the NIV and NLT does. Does that mean the King James is wrong? And it's been wrong all those years. Well, then let's think about it. Does God not want all people to come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord? Is peace not being offered to every single person? But they're not going to find it, are they? That's how we started this off. Unless they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's nothing wrong with the King James. Even if they meant something, that tells you how good God's Word is, even when He let sinful, fallible man participate in the writing. So if we can have that in God's own Word, and it's still both are fine to say to someone and stand behind them with Scripture that peace is offered to all men, but the only way you're going to find it is through Jesus Christ, then how can He use each one of us to spread the gospel message to those that are lost? How can He not use each one of us to help lift up others in the body of Christ? Whether they're a Lutheran today, or a United Methodist today, or an Amish Christian today, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And He wants to use every one of us to bring glory and honor to Him through our good works that glorify our Father in heaven. So they'll understand peace and we proclaim the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, right? That whosoever believes puts their total trust and faith in Him will not ever see death, but instead they'll see life. Not only see life, but see life as a child and heir of God, your Father in heaven. That's what this word tells you from beginning to end. That's why we're celebrating Christmas. That's why we light these candles to represent. Sometimes we get so anxious, Debbie, that we light them a week ahead of schedule, don't we? Most churches are on the first candle this week. Not us, we're on the second. <laughs> Because it always starts in November. See, I'll show you our, in, our, our mistakes. But if you Google when it should start for 2017, it's supposed to start in December, not November, which it does every other time because of the way the calendar falls. So we're going to be ahead of the game. We're going to be super excited. <laughs> and it'll still work because we'll do this one on the 10th, we'll do this one on the 17th, and then we'll do that one on the 24th. So it still works. Because we'll light the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. God still makes everything work. He just asks you to step out in obedience. Like Tom? Thank you. And I know some of those words, you're like, really? i got to read these words? <laughs> Don't worry, just do them. Because you're bringing glory and honor to God, not man. Remember that. And proclaim the Savior's birth. Grace and peace came to this earth 2,000 years ago. We've got to tell people about it so that they can experience and become part of the family of God. Father, we thank You so much for all the wonderful things that You do. We thank You for Your love. We thank You for the Spirit that is in this place. We thank You for this church that is the family of God. And may we be obedient to the head of the body, which is Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. We thank You that You came as flesh and blood, that You humbled Yourself before men, and that You died in humility and shame to bring me honor and glory as Your child so that I could honor and glorify You with my life so that others may know Your attributes through me, that You are faithful to Your promises. You are true. You are just. You are merciful. And You long for your children, to become into a right relationship with you. We just thank you and praise you for all that you're doing through the body. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.